Next uh, item on our agenda, the year end review. Yes. Dr. Cavallaro, Executive Director of Valley Council of Governments. Thank you. Uh, you have the normal two documents that we put out every year. Um, let's attack the thicker one first. Since this is, uh, this is uh, every two years, the, the board requests that I do a little more extensive overview of, of what the COG is and how it operates. So if you'll bear with me just a little bit, I'll try to get through that. He means the RV COG board, not the board. Right, I'm sorry, right, yeah, the RV COG board, sorry. Um, essentially, at its very basic, the COG is a service organization, and that's what we do. We provide service to our members and the community at large and also to our partners, our funders, and our peers, uh, because we work extensively with a lot of different people in the region and in the state, and, and the federal government, too. Um, we are a membership association. We have 23 members now since the Jackson County uh, Library District, District joined. We have both counties in Southern Oregon and all the, uh, all the cities. We go about our business in, in really three distinct ways. Uh, we are the implementers of several state and federal programs. Um, just as an example, the Metropolitan Planning Organizations. Now we have two of them in the region. We are staff for those two uh, organizations. And uh, we also are staff, uh, well not staff, but we, we administer the Medicaid program in the region. It's not our program, but we have a contract with the state to administer it. So those are some long-term responsibilities. We also contract uh, individually with certain jurisdictions to provide some specific services, such as IT in Rogue River. Uh, our land use planner is a contract land use planner for a number of our smaller jurisdictions. He also works with the county. Uh, you have an expedited review process. He provides uh, some of that uh, service when it's necessary, some years more than others, but he's there when that, when that uh, is needed. Uh, and we also, we also get involved with more complicated things that involve a lot of different partners, and we cobble together funding from federal agencies, state agencies. We gather jurisdictions together and work on a, on a common goal, and that has a lot to do with the fact that we're politically neutral, we're there to serve everybody, and, and we don't we don't have a dog in whatever fight it is that, that, uh, that we're involved in. Uh, and I guess there's a fourth one. Connie brought it up. Uh, sometimes we, we hit on something and we work on something for the common good, uh, like this lifelong housing. But that's, that's a fairly minor part of our program. Uh, I've got uh, a list of how we break out RV COG in terms of operations. We have nine major areas. But I did, before I start getting into more of that, I did want to um, mention that we did a performance review in 2012. Actually, it was the urging of Commissioner Skundrick. He thought it would be a good idea if we um, invited people in the community to give us their feedback on our VCOG, our programs, how we do business, etc. And we continue to have the full results, uh, results on our website. And I've just got a couple of excerpts there. And they're by no means uh, the only good results, but we were very pleased uh, with the results we got. We sent out, I think, approximately 600 surveys, and we got a third of them back, which is a pretty high return. And it wasn't just to select people. We don't have 600 friends. We send it out to people we do business with who are involved in our programs, who are impacted by our programs. Uh, anyone or anyone that we have on our mailing list, basically, for whatever reason. And as I said, we got a very good return. So in terms of how we're, we're broken out operationally, uh, let me just step back a moment and just say that uh, one of the weaknesses and the strengths of COGS around the nation, uh, we're in, in uh, all but two states in the country, and about half of those states have wall-to-wall -wall COGS, and about half are like Oregon, where it's not complete coverage, but one of the strengths and weaknesses is that um, no two COGS are the same. And so we, we are constructs of the needs of the region in which we're located, and also availability of funding determines to a great extent what the programs are that we offer. And just a lot of it, history and needs and availability of funding. So in our case, down here, 
Uh, in our planning department, one of our major focuses is uh, transportation planning. And that's because of the, uh, the importance of the metropolitan planning organizations in the region. The RVMPO is decades old, and it's probably the oldest and best example of cooperation among jurisdictions. It really is highly thought of in the state as a very, very functional NPO. And we have the new NPO that's centered on Grants Pass, but as you know, Jackson County uh, is also involved in that NPO. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to provide the staffing it needs to, to get them to where they need to be technically, but also uh, in terms of cooperation. Because I think it is, it is a really important part of this region, the level of cooperation we have. Um, we also have land use planning, and that I mentioned Dick Converse. He's our land use planner that provides uh, contract planning, uh, current planning to some of our member jurisdictions. You know, they only pay for what they need. When they don't need him, he goes away, and it doesn't cost them anything. Uh, but we also do some special uh, land use projects, uh, oriented projects for jurisdictions when requested. And we also do things on the side, like this, uh, this planners group that we convene every month. Uh, we thought it was a good idea to get planners talking to each other, and they're instrumental now. They're working with Kelly Matting on the implementation side of regional problem solving. And the idea is to make sure, number one is to make sure that jurisdictions can help each other in working their way through the conditions that are that are in the final report, that are in the acknowledged plan with the county. And it's also to make sure that whenever, when those UGB expansions come to the county, uh, that they're in good shape. So not a lot of time is wasted back and forth having to redo things. Um, and as I said, Kelly Madding is very involved in the process, and I think it's a, a real assistance to her. Um, community development, one of the things that's become very, very popular uh, one of our services is grant management. Grant writing, certainly, but grant management. Um, you have a pretty extensive list of different types of state and federal grants that our jurisdictions avail themselves of almost continually. And it's very difficult to ask an employee who has you know, a major job responsibility that doesn't include this on a regular basis to ask them to administer these kinds of grants. They're extremely complicated, and unless people do them on a fairly regular basis, it's a lot to ask. And there are also some potential repercussions, financial repercussions, if jurisdictions don't do them properly. And that has happened in the past in regions. We've had to come in. Uh, the IFA has asked us to come in and clean up a problem, usually in a smaller jurisdiction. So it's, we've had a lot of success. We've never had any issues with any of the grants we've administered, never any financial repercussions, no problems whatsoever. In fact, we've had a couple of instances where we've been offered more money because the IFA had some additional money at the end of the, of the year and, and asked us if we can, we can help them spend it. So that is a growth area for us. Are you talking about the Infrastructure Finance Authority? Uh, else? I'm sorry, IFA, Infrastructure Finance Authority. I'm sorry, it's the acronyms, they, they are with me. How to do that better. Natural resources. Um, this used to be the water resources department, and we've expanded its scope a bit. Um, we work very closely uh, with the county on a number <coughs> of natural resource projects. The two dam removals, Gold, uh, um, Gold Hill Dam Removal and Gold Ray, we were involved uh, with the county in working on that. And we have a number of things that we do. Uh, on and off with the county, with the city of Medford, and with a number of our jurisdictions. The total maximum daily load, the TMDLs, the stormwater, um, that's a lot of work that jurisdictions are expected to do by the federal government, a lot of details that need to be taken care of. And again, doing something like this regionally with our jurisdictions frees our jurisdictions up. Um, with the threat of, just so you understand, this is important, the TMDL's total maximum daily limit for particular heat particulates and contributions to water issues uh, can cause us direct penalties, financial penalties, to the county, and also uh, reduction in support from various federal uh, revenue streams that we have. Right. 
And the phase two stormwater zeroed in on the smaller communities. In the past, it was only the larger communities. Now, um, it's down to the smaller communities. So there's even less capability. I mean, there's a big difference between a Jackson County and a city of Medford and a Gold Hill and a Rogue River. I mean, the, the capacity just isn't there. And most of their people are normally overloaded as it is. So these are, these are very complex processes. And another thing that helps us um, with these kinds of projects is we have really excellent um, relationships with the state agencies. And in fact, uh, a couple of years ago, Gold Hill was in real trouble with, the, with their water intake. They were, they were taking about three times um, their water right out of the river uh, for their water treatment plant, for their water uh, service, and uh, they were in big trouble. They were under a cease and desist order. There was a, there was a fine, an everyday fine that was going to be levied, and we stepped in and, and facilitated that being taken care of, and they gave us time to move their water intake and to finally get that dam removed. Um, so we do have good relationships, uh, and that can really help. It can be the grease of the lubricant between our member jurisdictions and the state agencies. Uh, we've also worked on the, um, the Rogue River Greenway and uh, helped to get that to the point it is. There's still a long way to go, uh, but we, we did uh, do some, some um, I think, some important, uh, rendered some important assistance early on. Uh, senior and Disability Services, boy, that's a big part of what we do. Um, at times, I think our jurisdictions have a little more trouble in, in relating to that work because it's an indirect benefit to the jurisdictions. Um, you know, it benefits their citizens more than, obviously, the city itself. But we are and have been um, very strong participants in the state in our long-term care system, and it is one of the top two or three in the nation. A lot of the reforms that have taken place nationwide came out of Oregon, and we had a, a major role to play as a, as a cog decades ago in the design of that system, and we're fiercely proud of that. Um, the main focus of the long-term care <coughs> system, and everybody here um, probably should know this, that if you are aging in Oregon, this is a great place to age. And Connie was telling you about, about uh, people's ability to stay in their homes being critical. Um, you're, you're probably the least likely uh, in Oregon to have to go to an institutionalized setting before you really want to. And that's because we have very targeted programs of assistance at small levels to keep people in their homes because we know it's a lot cheaper than putting people in an institutionalized setting. And as we go up the rung, we have a number of different um, options for people. If they have to leave their home, they don't have to immediately go to a nursing home setting. There are a number of community-based uh, facilities or options that are available to them. But our main focus, whenever we can, is to keep people in their homes. And that means even if they need five hours of assistance a week to help them with bathing or to help them with some other critical chore, um, those programs are, are, are available in the state of Oregon and are heavily, heavily used. Um, another one of the programs, and we have a lot of trainings too to assist people. For example, um, we assist people in learning how to, how to be a caretaker, um, how to take care of their chronic conditions. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the biggest dangers when you get older in life is actually being a caretaker to an aging spouse. Um, more caretakers pass away due to the stress and the work of being a caretaker um, than anyone is aware of. So we have some trainings to assist people, especially with Alzheimer's, how to deal with a spouse with Alzheimer's, but just in general, how to be a good caretaker. Uh, one of the things that we do that, that assist people in staying homes is our senior meals program. And we do have one of the strongest senior meals programs in the state uh, per capita. We've never had a waiting list. Uh, we raise about a third of the budget that we use for our senior meals program. We raise the money, and some of that money is from the um, from our jurisdictions. The county is one of our biggest is the biggest contributor uh, to the senior meals program. But we also raise a ton of money from people, from individuals, from family members, just from people. Uh, we have about 400 volunteers at any one time who are either serving people in our meal sites or, more importantly, uh, delivering meals to people who are homebound. And Connie was talking about the demographics. 
Uh, the majority of our, our clients, our senior male clients, are over 80 years old, they're females, and they live alone. And usually, the volunteer who comes to their door with their meal, that's the only person they're going to see that day. And often, that's the only meal they're going to eat that day. A lot of, them, a lot of our clients divide that meal in half, they eat some of it at lunch and a little bit for dinner. Um, we think it's a real, well, it is the only safety net really left of its type in the county, uh, in the two-county area. And it's, uh, it's designed and we sensitize our volunteers to be able to recognize differences in the people they visit. Um, they are maintained on the same route so they get to know their clients and they can see any kind of real uh, decline in anyone's health. Uh, either mental or physical, and if they see a problem, they alert us, and we alert family members first. And then, if there's a, an immediate emergency issue, then we'll we'll, uh, we'll notify emergency services. Our volunteers have found numerous times have found people on the floor unresponsive, uh, with broken limbs. Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> there but, we think it does uh, it does save our jurisdictions money, our emergency services. Uh, money and a lot of angst um, with family members. Uh, we, uh, we are one of the later adopters of the ADRC, the Aging and Disability Resource Connection. The state decided to roll this out incrementally, and so they started in the north uh, with a couple of larger uh, uh, Medicaid programs, and, uh, and now they've gone to us. We've had it up and running for about a year now. And what this is, is an attempt to make accessing senior services and disability services um, a lot easier for just a normal citizen that doesn't, doesn't really know all these programs. So what this is, is a single number or a single website. Uh, anywhere in Oregon, you call that number and it's routed to the geographic area that you're concerned about. And you will get somebody on the phone, and mostly it's one of our employees, but we also have some community partners who also answer the phone on given days. And they will find out what it is you want to know. They'll get it clear. They'll also make sure that what you're asking is really what you want to know. Because sometimes people don't know what they, what they need to know. And they'll spend a lot of time on the phone until they can really understand what it is, the information they need, and they will connect them to the resources that they need to talk to, and if it's a really complicated case or if there's a reason for it, we'll send somebody out to the person's home to sit down and go through an even more comprehensive um, interview with them just to make sure that they, they get the information that they need. Uh, it's a real sea change, and it's having real dividends, and we recently did a survey, well we didn't, but uh, um, a, a survey was done on a client satisfaction with this and we actually rated higher than some of the more established ADRCs up north. So we're doing a good job. We're still in, we're only getting about 200 calls a month still, so it's, 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 uh, it's pretty small still, but uh, we, I think we're gonna have the time and the ability to ramp up as the demand comes up. But this is, this is something we want people to know about because it really does help. And finally, in terms of um, senior and disability services, we did, absorb about two years ago um, the Development Disabilities Crisis Diversion Services for Region, uh, region 5. That's a six county area. And these are, these are professionals when there is a, a crisis uh, with a developmentally disabled individual in these six county areas, we, uh, one of these employees will go out and try to mitigate the situation with that developmentally disabled person. And we also educate caretakers and institutions uh, how to deal with crises, uh, crises, sorry, crises, and it's just so uh, we don't have to respond in person as much as we do, and, and uh, the situation perhaps can be mitigated early so it doesn't reach a certain point. Uh, otherwise, our special member services, we do provide IT services to a couple of our smaller jurisdictions. We do the uh, we do the books for So Ready, and uh, we're in conversation now with Jackson County Library District to do their finances too. Um, we do a number of special things at odd times. For example, we did a we did a um, assessment of 
Central Point Public Works Department at one point. Um, and finally, we staff the Rogue Valley Public Service Academy. That's a, an ad hoc group of HR managers around the region. They get together on a monthly basis and talk about um, the kinds of trainings they think their personnel require. And then we go out and find a trainer. And uh, hopefully it's a local trainer, but if not, we bring somebody down. The idea is to provide training at a much lower cost for our member jurisdictions. It's local, so more people can be sent or, or it's at lower cost to our member jurisdictions. It costs a lot less to bring a trainer down here for 50, 50 people than it does to send somebody up to uh, Salem or Eugene and have them spend the night and go through training up there. They've served as a facilitator for multiple other special projects for the county. Um, Michael mentioned regional problem solving is one of those, but also uh, Executive Order 1207 is one that they sign up and facilitate. Mm -hmm. So there's a various projects that they do that have been very important to the county commissioners in the past. Michael didn't mention those, but I think. Sorry. Yeah. Well, we also have uh, monthly public managers meetings, and, and Danny sort of takes the lead on that. But um, it's a it's a really good opportunity for all the administrators and managers to get together and just talk over some things and find out you know what's a concern in one jurisdiction and somebody may not know and they share. They share some things. It's a it's a it's a really valuable process. A lot of these guys get together on their own, but in one room, uh, you can get them all. It's I, I think it's had some real dividends. In terms of our finances, um, by design, we're an odd duck. Uh, we we basically, in almost all instances, can only recover what we spend on doing something. So it's. It's very difficult to make any money on anything. It's really easy to lose money because you know how contracts go and the grants. You basically have to predict how much it's going to cost you to do something ahead of time uh, and hope you're right. And over over years and years, uh, we've gotten pretty good at it, but it's not always possible to recover everything we spend. Uh, at the best you can do is recover what you spend. So we have very little capability of, of generating discretionary monies. Um, our dues really are the only way we can we can do that, and our dues are about less than a percent and a half of our budget, and the, the true discretionary money part of that is about three quarters of one percent of our budget, about $62,000 is what we recover from our dues that we can use on uh, things that we, um, that we can decide how to use them. In terms of our total fund equity, I know it doesn't sound like much, but $800,000, we've maintained that fund equity for the last five years. Um, if you know anything about our past, we're in, we're in Wonderland. We like it right there. Um, for us, that's a really good level. In terms of our budgets, as you can see too, we maintained for uh, about a decade a between six and seven million dollar level of budgets. Uh, even through the recession, we, we barely budged on that. And we just recently, because of some additional money in, in senior and disability services, mostly through Oregon Project Independence, um, that budget has increased to almost $8 million. Um, I predicted uh, seven, eight years ago that we would maintain that six to seven million dollar level for years, and then at some point we would. Um, incrementally start creeping up, and that's what's happened. You might, um, you might also mention that your fund equities remain the same, and your balance budget's been stable, and you have not increased uh, dues for right. a number of years. We, uh, in 06, uh, 07, 08, we cut our dues by 40%, and maintained those dues at that level, uh, except for last year where we had a 2% increase. Other than that, they remain stable. And uh, our board wanted us to do that increase. Uh, we probably could have been okay without it, but they said that's enough with the frozen dues. So um, we are very aggressive in keeping our uh, three percent. Sorry, increase. Um, we are very aggressive in keeping our costs down. We've. Uh, it's been difficult. Medical costs, especially, have been increasing pretty dramatically. I can't believe I look back at when I came here how much medical costs were per employee. I just can't believe where they've gone. 
our, our benefits. We just backtracked on our benefits continually over the years. We've got a $1,500 deductible now, and uh, uh, it's nowhere near as good as it used to be. But what are you going to do? I mean, part of we've got to juggle being able to keep and attra attract and keep good employees with being a viable resource for our member jurisdictions, and that's what we have to do every year with our budgets. And um, I think we've done a pretty good job. People are staying at the cause. We don't have a, a high turnover, so we're doing something right. So, you know, people will trade uh, a fair amount of compensation for a good working environment, and I think it's important. Uh, it's important to consider all those aspects, and I think so far we're doing okay with that. With that, uh, but with that balance. Um, we, uh, How many employees do you have? We have a full time, uh, well, not full time, um, all employees just over 50. We have a lot of part time employees. Uh, some of them are just eight hours a week, the ones who work at your some of the new 50. Do you know what your FTE is? It's, I think, 34 maybe. I have to, I've got so many numbers in my head. I can get that to you. Um, Commissioner Bridenthal, I've been in, in conversation with Commissioner Bridenthal over the last year, and one of the things we, we've been looking at doing and trying to do is, is see if there aren't some areas we can expand our services a bit to try to spread out more of our administrative costs. Uh, we did look at DEQ's um, septic program the other year, and Danny, Danny told me to be cautious, and I was. Uh, looking at it on a two-county region, uh, assuming that program, uh, in the end, it was apparent, and basically DEQ told us that Jackson and Josephine counties are the only money makers in the state of Oregon for DEQ in terms of these septic services, and they use that revenue to uh, to pay for some of the services that aren't positive balance in the rest of the state. And until something happens where those services are, are assumed by local jurisdictions, they'd rather keep Jackson and Josephine counties to help defray some of those costs. And we used to do Jackson yeah. County. We returned it to the state because it was costing the general fund about $175,000 a year when we were at peak. And we, we seriously looked at it, but they were not they were not willing to transfer any of the equipment or vehicles. Uh, they had 40 filing cabinets of paper records, and they, they didn't want to assume the cost of digitizing those. The county, when they turned their records over, digitized them before they gave the program to D, back to DEQ. DEQ was not willing to do the same for all the records from Josephine County and the additional records that had built up paper copies um, from Jackson County in the interim. And so we said, this is, this is just not viable for us. We can't make an upfront um, investment. Uh, we just don't have the money. We don't have the wherewithal, and uh, we're just not going to do it. So obviously, it wasn't important enough for them to give that revenue source up. So they they weren't that serious about having the program localized down here. So we told our board a long time ago that we're not going to make any decision that carries any, any kind of um, financial liability that's as easy to see as this one was. Uh, we just we weren't willing to do that up for an investment. So um, we've now, um, and I know I've, um, Commissioner Roberts asked me a question about this, we are now looking at um, assuming the responsibility for the Medicaid program down here in both counties. And that's something that we looked at in 1996 and decided financially it wasn't a good idea. But since then, uh, the state has instituted what is called fund equity. That means that um, there's a steady, they will give you 95% of what it costs them to implement the program. In the past, the early um, transfers got down to maybe 85%. Over time, it diminished to about 85% of what it used to cost to implement um, the program. And they were losing money and they were having some real issues. So. We backed off from that possibility until fund equity was a reality. It's a reality now, and our RBCOG board authorized us to enter into an exploratory process to see the, the, vibe, the feasibility of taking over the Medicaid program. That would be 
well, we still haven't gotten the full amount, but probably biannually, it's it's a, probably a twenty million dollar uh, budget, and um, we're having some issues getting the states full full accounting of what it costs them. I mean, I know you have a the county has a very sophisticated financial system. You know what everything costs, and you can attribute it same way we do because we have we live with an overhead rate. We have to either direct charge or have a <coughs> paid for out of our overhead rate. So we know, we can tell you how much it would cost to do anything in the field, um, all the way up to what it would cost for, in terms of financial support, uh, 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 HR, IT, everything. Apparently the state doesn't have that capacity. And they gave us something, and uh, what they said it cost to implement that program, and we said this is, this is just, this isn't right. There's no way you can implement this program. Uh, for this amount of money, and uh, uh, it was a sort of an average across the state, and they even included the cost of the leases of the three buildings in there in what they wanted to give us as overhead, which, I mean, it's totally um, uh, not a practice to put a direct cost like that and call it an overhead amount. So they've got some very expensive leases um, that they're stuck with now for quite a few years, and. Um, you know, we said there's no way that you're accounting for all your support costs in the county. There's no way. You can't possibly. So they, they're going back and taking a look at what their real support costs are, their centralized support costs. And uh, again, we will not assume anything that has, that would pose a financial liability for the COG and would impact uh, service delivery in the, in the region. We're not going to assume something and then whittle it down to something less than it was. So we're looking at that, but if, if it is feasible financially, if it would help our bottom line, if it would allow us to de further decrease our indirect rate, it's at 17% now, we'd like to get it down even further if we can. If we can assume this uh, and it would benefit the region and the COG, uh, then we'll go ahead with it. Well, at least we'll recommend it to our board and our board makes that final decision. But we're not there yet. Uh, we've got this exploratory process to go through, and that's probably going to end sometime in late spring. I'm still not clear what all it entails. I you know, you and me I both. I thought it was staff, yeah. but it's, it's capital too? It's, it's mostly it's staff, um, but there are, some, there are some additional items that go along with it. Uh, you know, with state staff, you've got a lot of issues concerned with benefits. We're not a PERS employer we would probably be not in business if we had been a PERS employer. Uh, so there's a complication with, with that. Um, their leases, they have three buildings, they spend $90,000 a month on three buildings. And I know- In uh, Jackson County? Two buildings in Jackson County and one in Josephine County. And these are, that's an incredibly high, to me, it's an incredibly high lease cost. And I, um, the state has a structure where they don't own facilities purposely. What they do is enter into agreements for a minimum of 10-year triple net leases, and they may go up to 20-year if it's for consolidating services or there's a local benefit. But most of the, most of their leases are 10 years. 90,000 may sound like a huge number, but we're leasing our building over here for $120,000, and it's you know 100,000 square feet. So I don't know what the square footage is. No, we're here. But they they have. They have, uh, by region, ranges of rates which they enter into lease agreements. And it kind of depends on what time they, you know, if they entered into these lease agreements six years ago, they're going to be paying much more than if they entered into the lease agreements today. So it kind of depends on when they entered into the lease agreements. Um, and those aren't capital, per se, because the state doesn't own the buildings. They're an operating expense. Well, overhead, I, I thought it was just... Um, staff that this was attributed to not. Well, it would be a negotiation. I'm sure the lease, the, you know, the, at some point when the lease is expired, then it would be RV Cog's option of what they wanted to do to manage right. the staff. It's just that they, they're coming with that burden. And Michael's calling for it. It could have been that they were locked into great lease rates and you right. want to keep doing that. I mean, it just happens to be the circumstances. Do you know what those leases end? I'm going to imagine there are different times. But yeah, there are different times, and and the uh, and we don't have um, we do have that information. Um, I can't recall it right now. I know they are they have purchased land in Grants Pass, and they're going to build. Well, 
they're going to lease, someone's going to build a building for them, uh, for them to lease. And um, uh, they've been in negotiation with that. Um, it may be that, that uh, depending on the timeline here, we might be locked into a lease there or not. But our, our aim, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying it's a surprise, we would like to buy, purchase buildings eventually because that's when you can, you can get some return on that. I mean, it took um, <coughs> the first, uh, we purchased uh, our building in Central Point, our headquarters, the Cox headquarters, that was, only, um, that was only about 12 years ago that we did that. Uh, before then, the COG had rented, 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 rented the whole time, which is crazy to me. If you're not investing in your building, you're not, you're not, um, you're not a good steward of your funds. And um, we would do. Eventually, we would do the same. Our, the other transfers upstate have had did that years ago. They purchased their own buildings, and they're they're doing fairly well with it because you can rent it. Obviously, you can take that out of the out of the funds that come to you, and I think it's just a good idea. So eventually, if we did this and we managed to purchase buildings, the organization would be a lot more stable. Um, but if you have a, a, a lease amount of that, if you have that much lease, then it's hard to, to get moving on, on purchasing a building. So, sometimes you can negotiate, you know, this is all a negotiate. Right. You can right. negotiate with the state a premium for the period of the lease, and then you're, you know, Re reimbursements reduced once you can acquire additional properties. The, the couple things that Michael mentioned that are important, number one, the employee portion, is these employees will fall under the state employee transfer law, or public employee transfer law, I'm sorry. What that essentially means is that whenever employees are transferred from one unit of local government to another, or from one unit of local government to a nonprofit, it also applies. There's a question whether it applies for for-profit, for example, we transferred Although we shut down our libraries, we didn't transfer, but LSSI, who's a for-profit company, hired more than 50% of our prior employees. That hasn't been settled through the courts yet, but from going from a government agency to a nonprofit, it has. And you're required to compensate those employees at the same level for a period of one year with the transfer. So while they may not have PERS, what they will have is an issue with the total compensation package, which will be costly, but would be paid by the contract with Medicaid until, and that's if they take employees. If they do it within their current employee base, that doesn't apply, but if they're required to hire employees to deliver the program, they're required to accept those employees. That's usually done by how union contracts are negotiated, <coughs> typically by seniority, those the most senior employees, which are the most costly employees, right. would come into the program. The, those employees obviously don't want to do that because they're PERS eligible and they won't be PERS eligible in this. Their compensation will be equivalent, but they won't be PERS eligible per se. And, and that's just for the first year. Mm -hmm. It's right. just for the first year. So that creates a complication. The other thing to me, I know RB Cog Board will be voting or at least providing direction to Michael on this, that is uh, probably more of a significant issue is, you know, the way Medicaid Medicare work is that there's a match from the federal government to the state, which the state has to obligate funds to receive the match. And any time our state starts getting into trouble, then they start looking at whether or not they can make that match. And if you're in the contract to deliver the services, you're still going to deliver the services even if the state can't make the match and you're going to receive less funding. And that is not something they can guarantee or bind a future legislature to because there's a non-appropriations clause and will be required biannually to set a budget. Uh, and that is a problem. That's a problem for us in the cycle of delivering mental health services or development of disability services. It's even escalated, in my opinion, because of the Affordable Care Act and the waiver the state received with the promise of the ability to, to, to derive enough savings in this OHP population. But the same match concept applies uh, that when we get out far enough and the state doesn't save that amount of money because I don't believe they will. It's a 90% it's a with, with the waiver we got, it's a 90% to 10% contribution. That's huge. That means if we don't meet the standard of being able to create 90% of savings in system costs, that funding goes away. 90% of funding. So, and that's a, it's not to that same extent with no. this particular program, but it is a similar consequence if the state can't provide the match. And so that's not something that you can predict, and it is a great risk, and you guys should really look deeply at that. How quickly can you 
give this back to the state if something like that? I mean, is it a pretty streamlined process? That oh, you're obviously it has. These have been turned a couple of times in the state. These have been turned back to the state. Yeah. I mean, if it's a huge liability it, because it, of it, the it's not a fast process. Let me just you know the us turning over the DEQ the septic tape inspections mm -hmm. took nine months. Yeah. So you're and we were losing $175,000 a year. It's not, you can put them on notice, but you can't just say, oh, we're not responsible for it, it's yours. You have to create a transition plan. You know, in our case, it, it, it's a bad deal for our citizens that they have to go somewhere else to get their septic approval than right down in our planning department. But the state refused to give us the tools to recover the cost of what it costs for our staff to do it. And so now, our, you know, you have someone come in and they get their, all their building stuff here, and when we first transferred it, they weren't even going to open an office here. You had to drive to Josephine yeah. County to get a DEQ septic permit inspection for Jackson County. Because it just seems like it's a no-brainer to get to 95% of what they're paying right now to do these services when you're not having the PERS liability. When, I mean, that, that right. seems like that would be, I don't know what the percentage savings is alone, but that has to be a well, significant... I, I want to back up, though, because a lot of people misunderstand PERS now. now you have to look at the pool of employees that we're talking about. If they're tier one employees, that's true. Yeah. If they're under the new PERS, there is not much of a, in fact, you just got reported to you all that our, our PERS unfunded extra liability is a net asset to us now. In other words, Jackson County is an entity. Our, our PERS is fully funded and has money in reserve now. Now, most people out there don't know that. They think that you know we're robbing the system and not able to pay for our retirement system, but we do. And most local governments in the state now are also in that same position. That's because of three, two things for most people in three for us. One, the market picked back up. Two, there were multiple PERS reforms mm -hmm. that still have the ability to be overturned, depending on how the Supreme Court rules, but they stand. And for Jackson County, about six years ago, I recommend we create a side account, which reduced, we paid $9 million and reduced $20 million in cost for us over 20 years. So we have a little bit additional benefit that most local governments don't have. In this case, though, you know, the new PERS is not much different than a 401k. Uh, it's not a guaranteed benefit. It has a contribution you know, set up. And um, so people are mistaken a lot now when they say that you can get a big cost savings by not being in PERS. You can get a big cost savings if you, the pool you're talking about isn't all tier one employees, which may or may not be tier two. It, well, tier two doesn't still have the guaranteed eight percent, so even tier two is less uh, expensive than what tier one was. So it kind of depends on what the pool of employees are. If that statement you made is factual or not, it can be, but more than likely, I mean, like in our county, Jackson County, we're now pushing sixty percent of our employees are all in the new PERS. So you know, and but even on, even in addition to PERS, there's other employee benefit levels and, and employee costs at the state level that wouldn't be necessarily present. Sometimes in it's cheaper. Our, yeah. our medical plan, because I self-insured us, mm -hmm. and actually RV Cog would like to join. We would. And we've looked at a way to bring them in, mm -hmm. but our medical plan is less expensive than their medical plan. Right. And, we, you know, and it's because of the way that we set our plan up. But is that true of the state employees? No, the state, the state, of, the state medical plans are very expensive. We looked at them very expensive. They're probably pushing $2,000 per employee per month. It some, depends some on you know, it depends on single state. employee, family and all. But yeah, I, I found them to be extraordinarily expensive. Efficiencies would be better too, I would think. Efficiencies would be much better with us. Well, plus you have local control. That's local probably control. the main thing. And plus, the truth is for you know, if they are gonna cut a program, and I've said this to our board over and over, we can opt out of lots of things. But if they're gonna cut a program and we opt out, that just means the state's gonna make decisions for us on having less money. Right. Where I would prefer we make decisions about our county having less money. Same thing with this. I mean, if there's going to be less money, you would probably rather have the decisions being made locally than from Salem about what they're going to do in Jackson County. So, but but I'm just saying this has huge consequence. I mean, a, you know, a twenty million dollar budget uh, can could bury RV Cog in one bad year. Although. And, and we do, we, we are cognizant of that because we exist, most of our funding is um, state and federal funding. So, you know, we've been through the boom and bust cycles. Um, so far we've been uh, quite capable of withstanding that. This would be a lot bigger budget, but we haven't seen the wild swings in the Medicaid program 
um, that we've seen in other programs. So it's something that the feds really, at least on the federal side, they're determined to fund it reasonably well, at least not to have huge differences from year to year, and so far as maintaining a reasonable um, MAT situation. So, you know, we could see some, um, we could see some, some variation from year to year, but we would, um, we would be able to respond to that pretty quickly. Um, we've, I mean, that's a consideration for sure. Right now, our major consideration is getting an accurate figure from the state as to how much it costs them, and they're not, it's difficult for them to do it. And not to belabor, belabor this, because I know you guys are still working on this, but if the Rhode Valley Council of Governments does take, do the Medicaid, does it affect Jackson County's delivery of health care? No. No, it's a different. Okay. It's a different. So it's just the services you deliver through the cloud. Yes. Now, that's not to say that we can't find some efficiencies in, in closer collaboration with what the county does. I mean, that's always a possibility. I know, I know up, up north, the, the transfers, they are both um, AAA, so the, uh, America, uh, the, um, um, the aging programs and the Medicaid programs, when they're housed in the same organization, there's much better um, connection and collaboration between the two programs, and you get some efficiencies that way, and just better service delivery. Uh, we do what we can with the situation which we find ourselves now. For example, our senior meals program is housed in one of the, uh, the state offices, the Medi Medicare offices, State Street. Um, but we could do a better job if we were the, uh, if we were the supervising agency completely. And, and I'll say, I don't disagree with Michael's comment about the feds are consistent in their funding. I will say, and I don't remember the exact number today off the top of my head, I could go look it up, but Medicaid, I think, is funded for 12 years and it's bankrupt. So while the feds keep printing money to fund it and they put the appropriations, there's not money to back it up at some point. My concern isn't the federal government, because as Michael said, they've always found a way to spend money they essentially don't have. And I don't mean to be rude, but they, they don't have to have a balanced budget, we do. Right. The state has to have a balanced budget. We're required to. It's just the federal government that's not. And so when the state sees a hard time, that's when what the feds give us becomes less, and that's when it affects us. So when the state, and you know, here's the deal. I mean, the state lives off of income taxes. We live off of property taxes, which are way more stable. You know, we see gradual increases and gradual declines. They might see, you know, tens of millions of hundreds of millions of dollars of increase in a year, and then the same thing the next year for a decrease. Their swings are much more significant, and their responses to that because they haven't created a reserve or a way to stabilize their budget over time, which they should do, means that they cut their matches to these things. And that's when all of a sudden you're sitting on a $20 million liability and you only have $18 million in revenue and an $800,000 fund balance. So just, you know, I'm not trying to say you shouldn't look at it, Mike, one just saying, no, no, those are the things that are a concern for me. If, you know, And we are a member of COG and a voting member of COG. And we do uh, participate a lot in in activities with COG. Uh, Absolutely. And so we would for sure uh, build a reserve um, if we had this program, and our local control of the funding would allow us to do that. Um, we would not allow the union to run roughshod over us and, and demand every penny for either implementation or, or benefits and salaries, because we will tell them if we generate a reserve, that means in the lean years, your membership can remain employed. Otherwise, you'll have, you'll have to start losing people, and that is no way any good. But, and, and that is a good thing about local governments as compared to the state. And, you know, it's funny, I've said this before. At the peak, I think that we had $73 million in general fund balance or reserves, as most people refer it, plus another $50 million in dedicated fund balance. We had more reserve as Jackson County than the state government had <laughs> in reserve. So you can do it at a local level, and it is a good idea. Well, I say just just from a first blush, you would certainly think you do it a lot more efficiently and, and build up those those reserves and, and be ready for uh, if there were an issue that, that came down the road. I would, again, are are you both? I mean, not that you have to make a decision, but are you supportive of them pursuing this? option is looking at the information. Oh, I would think, yeah, absolutely. Looking at it and pursuing a, a, 
investigation of it. Yeah, absolutely. Again, that's what the prior board had already set forth on. So I just want to know where the board stands once it comes to vote. Um, right. In my my responsibility there. Right, and we we uh, do have a long-standing um, agreement among our board members that if any of our board members feels like they need to take a question back to their governing body before voting, all they have to do is say that they need to do that and the vote won't won't proceed. Okay. So on something like this, when we make a final recommendation, I, I anticipate that uh, several of our board members will say, you know, I need to take this back when you look at it. And you're going to be under, you would be under a lot of pressure from the union. I'm entirely certain of that. Um, the, the majority of them would like to remain with the state. And, and I, you know, that I understand the angst. If I were a state employee, I would be nervous about going local, quote unquote. Uh, but we have a very long track record, and we do a very good job in uh, what we do. And we care about service delivery. By the way, they don't have to accept a job with COG. I mean, they, they can find another job in the state. Right. They, the state has transferred multiple services to different level of governments over the years. Employees transfer within the state to other jobs if that's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. They're not required to go work yeah. for RV COG. They can choose to not take a job if they don't like it. And we did get, uh, I did get a lot of correspondence, um, very much form letter, um, saying please call us to get some information from their side. So, and so you guys are working with that group of people, you know, we, in, we are in conversation. And delivering your information. Right, and we just, yeah. We, we, we thought this would happen, and it has. We would have preferred that they stayed within the process until they actually had some information on which to base a decision, but yeah, understood. Great, and I appreciate your response in getting that sure. uh, information, which I mm -hmm. passed on. So. All right, so didn't mean to open the presentation, but thank no, you for right. addressing it. You're welcome. It? Um, and just, you know, every year I do the best job I can in, in making a list of all the things that we did in the prior fiscal year with our jurisdictions, and I do. I do recommend to our jurisdictions that if they have some time, they look through what we're doing with other jurisdictions, not just their own, because sometimes things just happen with some jurisdictions. Uh, the circumstances and others look at it and go, hey, I, I kinda, I'm interested in that, or what happened there? Tell me more about that. So it's a good idea, I think, um, if you can, just to look through this. And we, we do our best to try to monetize it, describe the benefit, describe the contractual relationship. Um, it's just a little additional information. None of the uh, none of the other cogs in the state do it to this extent, but I, I think it's a good idea. And the final the final thing is uh, every year I do a summary of of our potential professional services. I do a canvassing of all our of our other employees, and so this is these are the kinds of services that our jurisdictions could avail themselves of if they wish. If they're looking for something outside the jurisdiction, all I ask is they they contact us and we can give them a, an idea of how much it would cost and whether we do have that availability. Again, we're the only ones who do this too. Well, to the citizens, like um, uh, the gal was explaining that they charge for the inspections for the house. Mm -hmm. So I assume like for the services you're providing, you charge for Yes, we have to. We don't have any other source. By the hour, or is it? By the, normally by the hour with the state. Uh, some state and federal programs, we can do it by deliverable. Uh, but most of what we do, we do by the hour. And that's the reason we have to have the system that we have, you know, fully developed overhead accounting system. Um, we have to have direct charges. If something's not direct charged, it has to be part of our overhead. When they do an agreement, for example, with us or any other local jurisdictions, then there's a negotiation of what, what that is going to entail. 1207 is an example. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they're paid with administrative costs for administering that, which was negotiated. Right. They provided their overhead direct costs and direct costs. Uh, and, you know, we, that is a, is a funding mechanism from the state. And so, you know, that, that's, that's essentially on deliverables. There's certain steps that we accomplish mm -hmm. in the state that we purchase and then they reimburse each of the agencies for their work. So, but every, I mean, they have flat rates for certain things, but it kind of depends on the scope of the project. And, uh, 
Mm-hmm. We're, uh, we run a pretty tight ship. When I got here, we didn't, and now we do. And it was a lot of people working on that, not just me, for sure. Um, but we are at the point, and have been for several years, where we know what everything costs, down to the piece of paper, and we can track it. And if we lose money on something, we know why we did, and we figure out how we're not going to do it again. So we're pretty manic about it. I never want to go through the dark days again. I don't want to be afraid to pick up a phone. <laughs> That's an ugly way to live. That's and because uh, I cared for my grandma in my home mm-hmm. until she passed away. What kind of, what kind of like if I hadn't done that, what kind of waiting list? I mean, what kind of process does someone go through? Um, it's even easier now. You would just, if you had that issue, I would suggest the best thing to do is call the ADRC number and just explain the situation. What kind of assistance could I get? I think primarily for you, depending on the kinds of services you were helping your grandmother with, um, they, there could be a caretaker. Now, you can also, a family member can be paid as a caretaker, by the way, under the Oregon system, or someone from the outside can come in and then provide those essential services. They determine your level of need. There's a numbered system where, um, where the person is evaluated along this continuum, and then specific care that they need that can't be supplied otherwise is delineated, and then she would receive the help she needs to well, stay I just worked my tail off. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I'm sure it was appreciated, but um, uh, yeah, and family members are expected also, if they're available, to, to do what they can, yeah. but it's in everybody's best interest that people stay in their homes. There's, there's, oh, I agree. there's no downside to it, none at all. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people do what you did, though. Pauline. I think a lot of people don't yeah. know that there there's assistance I, available. Yeah. I just don't know what kind of, you know, sometimes I never, I mean, sometimes my perception, I wouldn't go to an agency, there's paperwork and there's time away and um, hoops to jump through that are just like, if you, if you go to the social rain. security office, it's certainly like that. <laughs> 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 if you, if you I haven't done that. We really try to make things happen quickly. And you know, our institutions here in the region are exceptional. And we have some very good institutions. And it's not, they're not bad. People do, uh, some people do need to get into an institutionalized setting. There, setting. There's not wrong with that. It's just for the majority of people in other states who have to avail themselves of that, we don't have to do that here. There are those other steps and it makes a huge difference. It, these are a lot like, uh, well, like my father had a severe stroke and he had uh, hit his IQ drop like 62. And he qualified for a disability, but it took Social Security two years before they actually qualified him and an appeal and you know, all sorts of stuff. These are really manufactured like crisis services. Almost. Yeah. I mean, they're meant to intervene quickly, assess quickly, and respond quickly. It's there are different systems, and some of the systems you're talking about, like Social Security, is one of those mm-hmm. um, that you know they are pretty slow. I yeah. mean, they're owner <laughs> And we have a good nonprofit system to network in this region. Um, the Shady Cove administrator had uh, an oxygen machine that, uh, I forget how he came across it, but didn't want to get rid of it, asked us, and we, uh, we helped him pass it on to a nonprofit that will make it available to someone who needs an oxygen machine. There's a lot of that that goes on in our region that sort of, it's not undercover, but it's just, yeah. it just well, it's happens. Like the Rockbound Medical Center, whatever it's called now, they sell their hospital beds and their, you know, 20 bucks. Yeah, so, and that's yeah. a resource that people should know about. Too. Yes. We that. Anyway, thank okay. you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.